Prakasam. Very good morning to all. Uh, so I'm very privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Sandhu Simam Periyanan from uh, CSIRO Canberra, Australia. So he has uh, graduated from uh, Tamil Nadu Agriculture University as a BSc Horticulture student, and he completed a MSc Plant Pathology from Kerala Agriculture University, India, and he also completed PhD from University of Sydney, Australia. And uh, he has uh, received a number of awards, almost 12 awards he has received in his short career. And recently he has received in 2017 Stanley Medal, New Phyt Phytologist from UK. And 2020 he has received a Poppy Science Award from the Australian Institute of Policy and Science. And 2021 he received a Fenner Medal from Australian Academy of Science. And also he has uh, received a number of uh, travel grants and scholarships, almost 12 he received. In his capacity as a PA and co-PA, he has almost uh, generated 2.6 million Australian dollar for his uh, research. And for his outstanding uh, record, he has uh, three patents in wheat stem breast resistant gene uh, from his lab, as well as for uh, he almost published more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals uh, for, for his credentials uh, in Google Scholar, total number of citations is about 2,200 and Hutch index is 18 and I tend index is 25. And presently he is working as a research scientist uh, in CSIRO Canberra, Australia. And also he is an adjunct professor at uh, Associate Professor at University of Queensland. I Warm welcome, Dr. Uh, Sambasima Periyanan, for this uh, lecture series, and uh, and I hope we will enjoy this lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pakasam, for the invitation, and I would like to thank each and everybody for taking your time and to come here to uh, to listen to my talk. I hope you, you all can see my slides, right? Yes, sir, yes, we are seeing your slides. Okay. So good morning, everybody. I'm sure most of you would be familiar with wheat rust. So wheat rust is one of the very most important disease of wheat. It cost around 1.3 US billion dollar to the global wheat industry. And this particular disease is caused by a fungus called Paxenia. And the disease is called rust because the infection of this particular factor produces redis, millions of reddish brown pustules that appear as rust on the corroded iron. So in wheat, we have three types of rust disease. The first is the stripe rust. As the name indicates, the infection of this particular rust produces stripes because this particular rust species grows only along the veins of the wheat leaves. So thereby it always appears as stripe. And the second one is leaf rust. It produces round to oval reddish pustules. And this particular leaf rust is very common. Wherever wheat has been grown, this particular leaf rust can keep appearing. And the third most important one is the stem rust. So as the name indicates, this particular species of the rust fungus can mostly infect on stem, particularly in the latter season of the wheat growth. So why we say that rust is so important because in more recently, highly virulent wheat stem and striper races emerged. For example, during the early 2000, a nasty stem rust race called UG99 emerged in the eastern part of Africa. During that time, this particular single race were able to evolve virulence, over, able to evolve virulence for more than 30 genes. And more than 80% of the worldwide wheat cultivars were found vulnerable for the attack of this particular uh, pathogen. And within a period of 10 years, this particular strain has evolved more mutant strains and it has trans traveled towards South Africa to the down as well as to the Middle East to the upper side. And strikingly, the other important factor of stem rust is the appearance of stem rust race in Europe recently, where there is no sign of stem rust for the past 15 years. One of the important causes for this one is stem rust are commonly a disease of warm climatic conditions. However, these new strains have developed the ability to withstand cold temperatures. 
That's where they were able to start appearing in the colder condition. And the next important one is the stripe rust. Wherever wheat has grown, they're all were stripe rust because this particular stripe rust, which is commonly found only in the cooler climatic conditions, started appearing in warm climatic conditions. That's one of the reasons. So routinely, fung fungicides are routinely used for the control of rust disease. However, in addition to the environmental damage, there are new strains that are evolving resistance to these fungicides. So the most important strategy that can be employed is the genetic resistance, which refers to the innate ability of plants to resist the attack of the pathogen. So here in the picture, you can see the plants on the left-hand side, which are very green, because they have genetic resistance, so they were able to resist the attack of the pathogen. Whereas on the plants on the right-hand side, they are more yellowish and they are more infectious because they don't have any genetic resistance, so they were unable to resist the attack of the pathogen. So here, throughout this talk, we will see how this genetic resistance can be widely deployed to manage disease, rust disease. So in terms of resistance, genetic resistance, broadly, there are two categories in wheat. One is seedling resistance. So as the name indicates, this particular resistance genes can function right from the seedling stage, and it lasts throughout the crop. And one of the important factors is that this particular seedling resistance can be effective only against particular pathogen. For example, SR45 is resistant against only against stem rust, and they are more strain specific. They are resistant to only particular group of strains. So I will come back to you later why they are specific to strains. So the next broad category is the adult plant resistance. So as the name indicates, this particular resistance gene, they were not functional during the sealing stage. However, they were functional only at the latter stages of the crop growth. For example, during the maturity stage, when they were able to produce the spikes and grains. So there are two categories. One is pathogen specific, for example, YR36. So this particular resistant gene can function only against stripe rust. The other category is the multi-pathogen resistant genes, for example, LR67, which can provide resistance against multiple pathogens, for example, against stem rust, leaf rust, stripe rust, and powdery mildew. Further, sterile sealing resistance confer strong to weak resistance, and they basically function based on the recognition of molecules related to the pathogen infection. So that's where they are very, very specific to pathogen because certain strains of the pathogen were able to produce the molecules that were recognized by these particular resistant genes. So wherever there is a matching effect or molecules produced from the pathogen that can be recognized by the R gene, those are the strains that can be protected from the uh, infection. Whereas the adult plant resistant gene, they normally produce very weak resistance, and they is adult plant resistant belong to the plant metabolic pathway genes. So they modify the plant structure or metabolic pathways, thereby the fungus won't be able to survive longer because of the changes in the plant metabolism. So before going into detail, I would like to play this short video so where we can see how sealing resistant genes uh, function. A 
I nearly fall from penetration to the brakes inside the stand. Now that the parasite is detected, the infected cell is sacrificed. I hope it's very clear from the video that when the rust fungus infects, it produces the feeding structure called a hostorium inside the plant cell, and it produces millions of molecules called effectors. And these effector molecules are produced to manipulate plant function. Thereby, the plants can keep producing molecules that are required for the successful infection as well as growth of the fungus. At the same time, plants have evolved mechanism to recognize some of these effector molecules and to provide resistance. So, when there is an effector molecule, and if it's recognized by the resistant protein, so there is a resistant response. Whereas on the other hand, plants try, the pathogen tries to modify or evolve a different effector molecule that cannot be recognized by the resistant protein, thereby it keeps growing on the plant. So there is an armed race going on between the plant and the pathogen. The pathogen wants to evolve new strains to escape the recognition of the odd proteins, and at the same time, the plant tries to evolve resistant genes to recognize the modified effectors. So there's always a race going on between these two key partners. So coming to the other plant resistant genes, so as I said before, it changes the plant metabolic pathways. So one good example is the sugar transporter protein. So this particular transmembrane protein sitting on the cell wall, uh, plasma membrane of the cell, it allows the transport of sugar from outside the cell towards inside. So when the fungus infects, these hostorium takes the sugar molecules transported by this sugar transporter protein. So this happens in a susceptible line. Whereas in the resistant line, the sugar transporter protein is a mutant version and it is modified so that this particular protein doesn't able to produce enough sugar molecule from outside to inside, thereby the hostorium won't have enough uh, sugar molecule for their growth, thereby the plant source resistance or slowed rust growth. And the, one of the important aspects of this particular adult plant resistant gene is because it changes the plant metabolic pathways, any pathogen that has been disturbed by this disturbance in the metabolic pathways were unable to grow much as seen in the susceptible. That's where most of these adult plant resistance come for multi-pathogen resistance because all those pathogens they require the sugar molecule will be arrested and they won't be able to grow. So next, coming to the source of resistance, one of the very important source is the ancestral heritage of cultivated crop. For example, the two cultivated forms of wheat, the durum wheat and the hexaploid wheat are hybrids. So the first, the A-genome the A-genome deployed class triticum voiticum and triticum monococcum evolved to form the triticum urato A-genome, which hybridized with the yes diploid genome, age loss peltoides, to form the tetraploid wheat triticum tergidum, which evolved to form the triticum tergidum neurum, which we currently grow as the durum wheat to make our pasta. At the same time, triticum tergidum dicocum further hybridized with another D genome grass, diploid D genome grass, age to form the hexaploid wheat, 
which we currently grow to make our chapati bread and other items. So clearly we can identify resistant genes from these wireless species and we can transfer to the cultivated crop. So the second most important one is land race. So land races are nothing but traditional cultivars that has been generated and has been stored generation after generation by farmers. And in our lab, we use two key sources. One is the Watkin collection. So Watkin is an English botanist who has gathered more number of uh, wheat land races from exploring 32 different countries. And this particular Watkin collection has been largely explored for rust resistance by my mentor and collaborator, Professor Urmil and Professor Harbans at University of Sydney. And the second source we use is the Vavilo wheat collection through collaboration with Lee Hickey at, at University of Queensland. We have 300 diverse panel and it has been collected from 28 countries during 1920 and to 1990. So one of the important aspects of land is, is because the farmers keep growing these cultivars traditionally year after year, they are more adapted to the local environment or local climatic regional conditions. So they are best suited for their conditions. So that is the most beauty of compared to the wild species which are grown in an a geographically diverse region compared to the cultivated area. The third most important uh, process where you can generate genetic resistance is through genetic engineering. So one of the very important aspects is gene transformation. So you can artificially create a resistant line by transferring resistant gene from the source line into a susceptible cultivar. Thereby, the susceptible line carrying the odd gene sequence will become a resistant line. And the second most important aspect is gene modification. So similar to resistant gene, plants also have genes called susceptible genes, which are required for the successful infection and growth of the pathogen. So once we were able to identify these susceptibility genes using gene modification techniques like CRISPR-Cas9 or RNAi gene silencing, we can knock down these susceptibility genes thereby the fungus won't be able to get the proteins or other molecules that are required for the function. Thereby, these lines will produce resistant reaction against the pathogen infection. So next coming to the different methods of gene cloning, how we can, so now we have identified different sources where we can source resistant gene. So next aspect is, what are the different techniques available to identify what are the genes and how they confer resistance? So the most common or the traditional method is MAP-based cloning. So here what we do is we take the resistant line, cross them with the susceptible line and generate a segregating mapping family. And next, using uh, chromosome specific markers like SSRs or SNP markers, we do genetic mapping. So this is the most important step to identify where your origin is located and what are the different markers next to these origins that can be used as a marker to Yes, this origin presence in breeding lines. So the third most step is the physical mapping, where you can zoom into the genome of this resistant line, and you can identify what are the different genes present in this locus. So physical map can be generated using back libraries, and more recently using reference and pan genome sequence. So once you develop the physical map for your origin locus, the next step is screening to identify which one of these candidate genes is your origin. To screen these candidate genes, the first thing is you need to develop a mutant population. So the mutant population is nothing but you take your walled line, treat them with EMS or sodium azide or with any other mutagenic agent, and you knock down your resistant gene. Thereby, this wild resistant line will become susceptible because the resistant gene has been knocked out. So by screening your candidate gene from the locus on the mutant line, you can see which of these candidate gene source mutation compared to the wild resistant line, then those gene can be the origin of interest. So final step is the confirmation. So you're going to amplify the knocked out mutant gene from the resistant line, the fully functional gene from the resistant line, and you're going to transfer into the susceptible line. And then you're going to do the complementation test where you're going to infect the susceptible line carrying your resistant gene. And if it shows resistance, then you know that the origin presence source resistance. So this origin is responsible for the resistance. So using this technique, we have, we have identified more than six resistant genes. So thanks to the advancement in DNA sequencing and capture technologies, and one of the very most uh, important 
break, uh, breakthrough in gene cloning is this resistant gene enriching and sequencing technique. For example, the whole wheat genome carries more than three lakh genes. Whereas if you are zooming into a particular group of gene, for example, nucleotide binding site, leucine rich repeat gene family, there are only 3000 genes. So this nucleotide binding site, leucine rich repeat gene is one of the very most important gene in plant defense. More than 80% of the resistant gene that has been identified so far belong to this particular group of gene family. So using this particular gene family sequence, we can isolate sequence only related to this gene family, and then you can compare between the wild type line and the mutant line, and based on the sequence difference, you can identify which one of these gene is responsible for resistance. So using this uh, basic concept, we have developed a mutrensic method. So here, what we have to do is, first thing is to generate mutant lines. So you take your wild type line, um, treat with EMS or sodium as a mutagenesis agent, then you create knockout mutants. The mutants that have mutation in the resistant gene, thereby they are susceptible. Then you isolate the total genomic DNA from the wild type as well as from the mutants, then break them into small fragments and then ligate with adapters. Then use the reference genome and predict all the NLR type gene sequence and design a probe. So these probes are nothing but 120 base pair exon sequence from this predicted reference genome. Then using this and based on PCR-based hybridization technique, you try to capture all the fragments that are related to NLR sequence. So more than 80% sequence that has more than 80% similarity will be captured based on this process. Then using the streptoviridin probe that has been, the streptoviridin which has been bound to this NLR probe and using the magnetic field, you can specifically extract the hybrid fragments that has been hybridized with the NLR probe. Then using a PCR amplification and primer specific to this adapter, you can enrich the captured NLR fragments to 20 times or 40 times coverage. So if the capture, if, if the NLR probe captured two fragments, using the PCR, you can make these two fragments into 40 or 80, so that when you're doing the downstream sequencing, you will be able to have a very clear sequence. Then by comparing the uh, sequence of these NLR fragments from the wild type as well as mutants, and based on the changes that has made this gene uh, non-functional, you can identify the gene of interest. So this particular technique is mainly developed by Brande Wolf's team at the John Inner Center, and we are collaborators. And using this technique, we have screened, we have cloned more than uh, eight to nine genes. So next, the variation technique is the agrancy, association genetic resistant gene enrichment and sequencing. So here, instead of creating mutant population, what we do is you take a germplasm and then by screening against multiple pathogen strains, you group them into different categories, like group one, which can be resistant to four strains, susceptible to three strains. Group two, it can be resistant to eight strains, uh, susceptible to four strains like that. Based on their response against different group of strains, you can categorize into different groups. And then you take the total genomic DNA from each group and then isolate the NLR specific fragments, then sequence. And by comparing the fragments from group one to group two or group three, you can identify your NLR gene of interest that is responsible for the resistance pr present in particular group. So the third most important tool is the mute chrome C mutagenesis chromosome sequencing. So in wheat, there are 21 different chromosomes, seven A genome, seven A chromosome, seven B chromosome, and seven D chromosome. Once you are able to identify the particular chromosome that carries your gene of interest, what you can do, instead of analyzing the whole, the whole set of chromosome, you can specifically isolate the chromosome that carries your gene of interest from the wild type as well as mutant. Then by comparing the sequence from the wild type and mutant, you can identify your gene of interest. So now we have seen so many tools that can accelerate the identification of resistant gene. So why we need to bother? Why we need to uh, worry about? So one of the most important application of identifying the resistant gene is gene-specific markers. For example, in breeding or in generating rust-resistant lines, the traditional method is you need to grow all your breeding lines, spray them with rust, and then based on their response, 
you need to identify the line carrying your gene operators. For example, if you want to screen a bunch of breeding line against UG99, you need to send your seeds to Africa and it has to be screened against UG99. So there are a lot of hassle like MTA and other quarantine issues. Whereas if you know the resistant gene and if you know the gene sequence, you can easily develop gene specific markers so that when you are screening the DNA of these breeding lines, Based on the presence or absence of the gene marker, you can easily detect the resistant line. So it's a very quick rapid method. Within two or three days, you will be able to identify which line carries the, your gene because you don't need to grow the plants. Straight from the seed, you can extract the DNA and you can amplify. And this particular marker are transferable to any lab. Anywhere in the world, you can do it. Whereas if you want to do the traditional rust infection screening, it has to be done only in the lab where they have this particular rust strain. And the next important application is you can easily transfer our genes from wild species to cultivated species. There are a lot of ancestral species of wheat which are cross incompatible to the cultivated species. And one of the main reasons is there are different priority level and there are a lot of other undesirable agronomic traits that has been linked with the wild species. For example, grain shuttering or sterility or there may be a lot of, uh, for example, it can be other linkage acts related to grain quality or other things. So what happens when you are doing the conventional breeding techniques, along with your origin of interest, the genes responsible for the poor quality traits or will also be dragged into your resistant line. Whereas by cloning only the resistant gene sequence, you can just transfer only the origin sequence into this uh, cultivated wheat so that you won't have any problem of linkage back. So before getting into the wheat transformation one, so at CSIRO, we have adopted the Japan tobacco method of wheat transformation, and we were able to establish this pipeline. I think throughout the world, I think we have one of the best protocol for wheat transformation. So in this unit, led by Mick ILF team at CSIRO, we have standardized this protocol for more than 10 global wheat varieties. And in this unit, we have processed more than 200 gene constructs and they have generated more than 10,000 transgenic clients. And they have also generated protocols without using selection markers. And we have also achieved a highest uh, success rate of 51%. So one of the important application of gene cloning is you can trans even transfer genes from different species, for example, in our lab, we have also transformed this LR34 and LR67 multipathogen resistant gene from wheat to other species. For example, it has been transformed into barley, where it was found to show resistance against rust and mildew, to rice, where it shows resistance against blast, and in canola against black leg, and in sorghum against anthraconus and rust. So as I said to you before, these particular gene are part of the plant metabolic pathways. For example, LR34 is involved in ABA transport, whereas LR67 is involved in sucrose transport. So what happens, whichever pathogen that are interfered with this ABA or sugar transport, they will be blocked or they will have slow infection. So that's where whichever pathogen that were unable to, uh, unable to tolerate the changes in the ABA or sugar they will be arrested. So that is one of the beauty of these other plant resistant genes. So the final uh, key important application of this uh, gene isolation is you can pyramid genes from multiple species. For example, here we have uh, multiple gene cassettes. So some genes there are from wild species, some genes from cultivated species. Whereas if you want to do by traditional crossing, it's, it really takes a lot of time. And the, and the other problem is when you are doing the conventional crossing, these different genes are present in different chromosomes. So when you're trying to select a line that carries all the genes, you need to do multiple crosses to make sure all the genes are integrated. Whereas with the gene cassette technology, you can generate a gene block where you can clone all the gene fragments as a single block, and you can insert as a single gene block. So when you're doing the crossing after introduction, these particular gene block will behave like a mental inheritance and it will keep going generation after generation. So one of the important aspects of gene pyramiding is that the pathogens needs to accumulate a lot of virulence to overcome this particular gene. So as I said to you before, when the pathogen overcomes a 
where resistant line, it has to generate mutation in the specific effector molecule so that it won't be recognized by the specific origin. So if you have a gene cassette that has more than six genes, the pathogen has to undergo six rounds of mutation and the strain that can accumulate all the six mutation is the one that can overcome this line with multiple genes. So that's where the genes, the gene cassette that has more number of genes are always strong. So the final take home message is genetic resistance is one of the ideal management strategy. It's more sustainable and more durable and it is environmentally free from other hazards like toxic to other uh, microbiomes or any other uh, beneficial organisms. Next, based on the advances in GNA, uh, DNA sequencing and capture technology, there are a lot of tools has been developed for rapid identification of resistant genes. And the third thing, once you are able to identify the resistant gene that is responsible for the resistance, you can use it for marker resistance selection or for gene permitting or for editing and also to understand the molecular mechanism behind this resistance function. And by using synthetic biology approaches, you can always introduce novel resistant genes. So finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the team and the rest research group members at CSIRO, collaborators at John Inner Center, um, collaborators at University of Sydney, UC Davis, USDA, University of Queensland, ANU, ICAR, and PAU. Finally, I would like to thank the funding bodies, particularly GRDC, Grains Research and Development Corporation, which is one of the Farmers Federation, which uh, spends a lot of money for the rust research in Australia, and the Australian Government, Australian Research Council, for to undertake studies on the basic aspects of plant disease research and durable rust resistance in wheat project that is funded by um, Borla Global Rust Initiative uh, project and the two blades funding. Finally, I would like to thank especially Dr. Pratibha Sharma, President IPS for the invitation and Dr. V. Prakasam for nominating me for this special lecture. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful and uh, mind-provoking lecture on uh, wheat rust resistance. Now the questions are invited from the participants. Hi, Sam. Can I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you said that you guys have transformed LR34 and 67 into wheat, barley, rice, and it's giving in rice blast resistance. Do you have any idea that uh, whether these genes are conferring blast resistance, wheat blast resistance in wheat as well? I think um, so the, I think what happened before getting into the transmission, they tried to analyze the wheat lines carrying the native LR34 or LR67 and they screened in uh, Simmet as well as in Bangladesh, they don't provide any resistance against um, wheat blast. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks like the wheat blast and the rice blast, they are a bit different in their specificity. Right, thanks. Mm You are working only on wheat rust disease or uh, other wheat uh, diseases also. You are looking for uh, resistance against different diseases in wheat. So I think uh, particularly the part I have been working is mainly on wheat rust. I have little bit experience working on barley rust. And more recently, uh, I have been involved in working for resistance against myrtle rust in eucalyptus. Yeah. And in collaboration with uh, Professor Harbans and Professor Urmil, who are in the audience, we were also keen to work against um, uh, pulse rust disease in pulses to identify resistance against rust, rust disease in pulses. So. Uh, 
हेलो सर 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 दिस इज बास सर व्हाट अबाउट टीपी लस्टर वी ऑकेजनली सडनली इट इज कमिंग इन सदर्न रीजन सदर्न पार्ट्स ऑफ कंट्री इंडिया so do you have any idea sir that we can model it for forecasting uh, especially chickpea rusty sir mm-hmm. sir can you repeat the answer sir, i couldn't able to beginning part sir, of your actually in southern southern part of country in southern part of country especially in andhra pradesh and karnataka uh, very occasionally we used to get chickpea rust chickpea mm-hmm. okay. sir is there any particular reason or uh, any correlation with the weather weather parameters why uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can predict when it will come so is there any idea sir uh, any work has done uh, i have very limited experience on uh, chickpea rust huh? but definitely based on the experience what we have with ra- wheat rust so there are yes, two sir. key factors that has played an important role for the rust epidemics throughout the world so one is the uh, climatic condition that the pathogen were able to adapt to new climatic changes and the other aspect is the increased human migration so for example almost most of the lineage groups in australia they were introduced from overseas okay okay so the chance that because of presence of ecrisat or there may be more migration of staff members or uh, chickpea experts coming traveling from africa to hyderabad or so there are the human factors that play an important role why a particular area can have a rust so this has been recently identified particularly for wheat rust so mainly okay. human migration human migration okay yeah sir okay sir thank you thank you any other questions from the participants Gogoi, sir. So, uh, myself, Dr. Robin Gogoi, Secretary, Indian Phytopathological Society. So, I congratulate Dr. Sambasivam for a presentation, very beautiful presentation. It is really educative, as if I have attended one class, not, this, not a lecture. right from the basic especially through the videography what he was trying to make us understand it is really beautiful so in the beginner also very easily can understand how that uh, suppose eurospores can move trap and settle on the uh, this uh, leaf of the host plant and penetrate so it is really beautiful so uh, related to this uh, wheat rust disease so just i would like to know so as we know that seedling resistance and apr so how much they are closely correlated and how much success we can achieve by combination of both or individually again uh, for uh, obtaining uh, this uh, wheat rust disease resistance so we always recommend combination yeah. because the time when the apr are about to kick the resistance the plant will be smashed already with the heavy load of rust because for example in australia when we were growing so in australia wheat is grown as a winter crop so when the crop is small we will have the first incidence of stripe rust because it's a winter crop the stripe rust hits more on the winter season so when during the seedling stage the stripe rust will hit so if you don't have a seedling resistant for stripe rust the plant will be smashed even when it's at the two leaf or three leaf seedling stage so you need to have a seedling resistant gene to protect the plant right at the seedling stage then mm-hmm. when the plant grows to the adult plant stage that's where the adult plant stage kicks off so the beauty between seedling and adult plant stage is seedling resistance or fd vagus only particular strains whereas the adult plant resistance they are effective against multiple strains or almost all strains so at the end of the crop season when there are new strains evolving through mutation there is a chance those mutant strains won't be able to survive for longer period or to be carried out for the next generation because of the presence of adult plant resistance they can slow down the proliferation of new strains 
So we always recommend combination of both sealing as well as adult plant resistance. So that's where you can have a full protection right from the sealing until the adult plant stage. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So one more thing, suppose uh, since uh, in your today's talk, you have emphasis on the this uh, host uh, resistance, so genetic uh, manipulation, uh, genetic makeup, makeup manipulation. So for management of this uh, rust disease, so in India, so very popular fungicide, this propiconazole is used under sterile biocentric inhibitor group of fungicides. In Australia, is there any other um, chemicals, fungicides used? Um, I, I don't have much awareness of them. I think my professors, uh, Professor Harbans or Professor Urmil may have a little bit idea. Yeah. Um, I don't have much knowledge on the types of fungicides used here. Maybe Professor Harbans can uh, help with us with this particular question. Okay. Or Urmil, okay. maybe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Robin Gogoi, sir, Secretary Indian Phytopathological New Delhi to propose vote of thanks. Oh, so at last that uh, community has come to me, the, this organization. So thank you, Dr. Parameswari. So I hope even though today uh, this participation was few comparatively, but uh, those who ha have not attended today's lecture Dr. Samba Sivan's lecture, really they have missed. Anyway, so uh, Dr. Samba Sivan, you have accepted our request to deliver your beautiful talk based on your practical experience. Really, it is good. It, so our this members and also plant pathologists, really, I feel this they have got benefit from your lecture. Thank you. And also, uh, I would like to this, uh, thank my this, uh, friend and organizers like uh, Dr. Parameswari, Dr. Pramod Gupta, uh, Dr. Prasan Jambulkar. And also uh, uh, I can see our this president-elect Dr. Rakesh Pandey. So he has also, he's also connected right from the beginning of in the, your lecture. So Dr. Sambasivan. So I hope in future also you will share your experience through our Indian phytopathology platform. So I thank all of you, one and all. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Yeah. Rakesh Pandey, sir, would you like to say something? He is our president-elect. No, he disconnected. OK. OK, sir, we can wind up today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Vannanda.